Okay, the next talk is uh, Bernhard Mitzelmacher, who's going to talk about precision prediction for particle physics. Um, I actually benefited from this early on in my career when I measured the, the top quark mass using precision measurements at LAP. Um, things have advanced somewhat since then, and uh, Bernard will tell us about it. Hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to talk a little bit about my research today. I'm going to talk about the precision predictions for particle physics phenomenology, maybe? Yes. Um, I want to talk about particle physics. And in order to do that, I want to set up a little bit what I actually mean by that. Yes, I'm sure you all have seen this decomposition of the fundamental interactions of nature into four different categories, into electromagnetism, into the weak force, the strong force, and gravity. By particle physics, uh, or talking about particle physics, I want to focus on the combination of these three into one uh, combined uh, theory, the standard model of particle physics. Gravity is a little bit the odd sheep, the black sheep in the entire game, and I'm also not going to talk about it today. I want to focus on these three. And uh, the standard model of particle physics is a very, very powerful theory. It's a quantum field theory. This is also where my interests come in. And it's so powerful because it's extremely concise. It fits on the side of a coffee mug. These are the defining equations for it. It's very predictive. We can use it to make uh, predictions for observations in our life. And uh, the predictions are quantitative. This theory is also extremely successful because uh, if, if you think about any observation, any measurement that you can do uh, in, in your daily life or other, it is basically compatible with the standard model of particle physics and gravity, of course. There are very few exceptions. Now, um, if we want to test the standard model of particle physics, there are a couple of aspects that we can ver test very easily. Electromagnetism is all around us. We have light, we can build microchips, we can manipulate it fairly easily. And therefore, we can test uh, this, uh, this component of the standard model. We have access to its fundamental particles, the photon and the electron. Other components are much more difficult to test. Uh, if we think about the strong force, uh, its carriers are quarks and gluons. They are the fundamental building blocks of the proton, for example. And accessing these quanta is extremely difficult because the proton is living already at length scales of 10 to the minus 15 meters. So in order to resolve that, we need a very powerful microscope. And there's one particular microscope that I want to talk about today a little bit more. And this is the Large Hadron Collider. This is an experiment that is located uh, in Geneva. You can see Geneva here. These are the Swiss Alps in the background. Uh, this is Lake Geneva. And underground all that, there's a 27 kilometer long tunnel. And this tunnel, uh, what it's doing is, is accelerating protons to extremely high velocities, uh, this fraction of the speed of light here. Um, the advantage of accelerating protons to this incredible speed um, is that well, what we really want to do with them is smash them into each other. So we are colliding them. We, we are looking at head-on head collisions of these protons. And the advantage of doing that is that uh, the time scale at which these interactions are happening are so short that whatever actually is going on with inside the proton uh, is irrelevant on this time scale. So it really looks like when we're colliding protons as if we were colliding these fundamental particles of nature with each other themselves. Now, by studying the debris that is coming out of these collisions, uh, collisions, we can actually learn something about the interaction that was going on when these protons were colliding. So we take pictures of this uh, debris that is coming out of the collision. These pictures look something like this. You see lots of tracks, lots of particles that are being produced. See? And what we are doing is uh, we are measuring their energies. We are measuring the angular distributions. We're looking at how they are bending when they are propagating through uh, cameras, very, very complicated detectors, um, very large, complicated cameras. And we're not just looking at one of these pictures. We're looking at many of them. Actually, there's about 600 million collisions per second happening at the LHC. And recording all this data and looking at all of them uh, allows us to really look, uh, take a, a, a look on the fundamental interactions themselves and learn something about them. Now, this program at the LHC um, is uh, very successful. As a matter of fact, it has produced for us uh, uh, evidence for the existence of a new fundamental particle that uh, was presented in 2012, shortly after this discovery was um, associated with a Nobel Prize even. So clearly, finding a new fundamental particle is something that is great for our field. This is really, this is really phenomenal. It doesn't happen very often. The, the particle before that, the last fundamental particle that was discovered was the top quark in 1995. So this doesn't really happen very often. Um, However, it's not uh, just the, the fact that we have a new particle available. It's really the uh, fact that this entire picture of interactions that I showed you at the very beginning has to change because we know that the Higgs, the Higgs boson is present. We have to really introduce a fifth force, a fifth uh, uh, kind of interaction into, into, 
into our picture of nature. And uh, this Higgs force, if you want, is now finally accessible to us and we can test it using this experiment in Geneva. So for the first time, this particle physics uh, stand-up model is uh, complete. We have access to all its quantum. We have access to all its constituents. And we really can start to ask uh, um, a lot of very uh, fundamental questions about this new sector of interactions that we finally have access to. We can ask questions like uh, uh, what, are, uh, what these interactions actually look like. We can determine their strengths. We can investigate uh, the mechanism to generate fundamental masses. And we can, of course, ask questions like uh, is the standard model everything that is out there? What are, what, are, what are its natural limitations and so on? And the method in order to answer these questions is to derive uh, questions that we can observe, that we can answer using the experiments at the LHC and compare them to theoretical predictions using the standard model of particle physics. Now the first thing we need to do in order to achieve this is uh, to, answer this, to ask these questions in the language that we can relate to the observables that are measurable by our detectors. We can ask questions there like how often are particles produced? We can ask uh, questions like what are their masses? Uh, with which energies are they produced? What are their typical spatial distributions? How often are they produced alongside each other? And this answering these kind of questions, this is what I'm uh, trying to do using quantum field theory. So this is uh, where my work is coming in. I want to illustrate this process by looking into one particular question in detail. And this question is, how many Higgs bosons are produced by the LHC? Now, clearly, this is a very central question. If we want to know something about the Higgs boson, it's good to know how many we're actually making. If we are getting the answer to this question wrong from a theoretical point of view, and we compare that to our experimental observation, we see discrepancies. There's really something fundamental that we don't understand about nature. This would really uh, shed a lot of, uh, you know, shed our understanding to some degree. So clearly, we want to answer this question very precisely. The way this works is uh, we are phrasing this question or the answer to this question in the language of quantum field theory. Typically, answering this question using quantum field theory is very difficult. There's hardly any quantity that we can calculate exactly in this theory. However, we're in the lucky situation where at these energies, uh, we have small parameters uh, in our standard model of particle physics. For example, this strong coupling constant, it's roughly 0.1. And whenever a physicist uh, sees a small parameter, what they're going to do is they're going to write down an expansion. So this is also what I'm going to do here now. I'm going to take uh, the answer to my question, and I'm going to write down an expansion in this parameter. So I will have a leading order term, and I will have a term that is power suppressed by one power in this uh, small parameter times a next to leading order correction. I can write down further subleading terms like next to next to leading order corrections and further further subleading terms like next to next to next to leading order corrections and as I go further to the right and add these contributions my predictions for the outcome or for this answer to this question will get more and more precisely now what I want to show you is how well this actually works if you look at predictions that were made uh, using this leading order approximation, we see that in the year 2018, we would have produced roughly 900,000 Higgs bosons by the LHC. I'm going to show this graphically here as well in this plot. So here's the number of Higgs bosons, and here I'm going to put the different orders at which I'm uh, making my approximation. Now, adding the first subleading correction, I see a gigantic jump. I see a jump of 122%. So okay, our, our naive uh, uh, expectation was a little bit too naive. It doesn't work quite that well. So we have to look, look a little bit further. We have to actually see how far we can um, uh, push this game. And by looking at next to next to leading order contribution, contributions, I'm adding another 500,000 Higgs bosons or, at another, or another 25%. So this jump is already smaller. It's already getting better, right? It's not entirely uh, the level of precision that we might have in mind, but uh, we're getting there. Adding one more order next to next to next to leading order predictions, another 100,000 Higgs bosons, we see now really something that starts uh, to look very nice. We see something where our perturbative approach is stabilizing. We are getting to a level where we can make nice, reliable, precise predictions for the outcome uh, of uh, our collider experiment and answer this question of how many Higgs bosons are being produced very precisely. Now, as soon as we have precise predictions, we can actually go ahead and compare them uh, with the experimental results. And there's something very nice happening. And that is uh, that uh, our fundamental predictions are lining up with, in this case, Atlas data extremely, very, uh, extremely nicely. Um, so we see an agreement between theoretical prediction and uh, um, our uh, measurements that are being done. Now, one thing that I want you to take away from this slide is, is, is as well that uh, doing these predictions is not, uh, is not an easy thing. If you look at the leading order um, uh, prediction, this was done in 1978. In 1991, a next to leading order calculation was performed. In 2002, next to next to leading order um, uh, approximation was performed. And only over the past couple of years, um, I was able to add this next to next to next to leading order piece to the entire game. 
And when you look at the, the steps in between, you see it takes us more than a decade to go from one order to the next. So clearly there's a huge step in complexity happening if we are uh, wanting to go from one order in perturbation theory to its next one. Um, there's also another way of seeing this. In, uh, the, the amount of my publications that went into making this one prediction, um, well, this is about it. So you have to really investigate uh, quite a lot and uh, invest a lot of time into making these kind of jumps. Now, there's one statement that I want to make that I think is uh, central to my research interests, and that is that our capabilities to derive quantitative and falsifiable predictions from a theory actually reflects our understanding of this theory. So I really, I really think that uh, improving our predictions also improves our understanding of the theory itself. So we are, by, by pushing the limit in what we can actually predict, we are pushing the limit of what we actually understand about the standard model about quantum field theory. And in order to improve our predictions, I think there's three avenues that you can actually take. Um, one of them is just uh, improving our toolbox, making our algorithms better, looking at the, the, the tools that we are using now and developing them further. Another one is mathematical developments, so looking at the, the language in which we are phrasing the questions and improving our understanding of this language. And the third one is conceptual development, so really understanding the underlying physics better and trying to figure out uh, uh, other ways of thinking about problems. Now I want to give you an example of uh, the algorithmic developments that we actually have to undergo. Um, if you want to answer these questions, how many Higgs bosons were produced in 2018, you have to calculate integrals. I'm not gonna tell you where these integrals are coming from, you just have to calculate them. In order to do leading order predictions, you have to calculate one. In order to, next to, leading order, to do next to leading order predictions, you have to calculate about 100. Next to next to leading order predictions, about 50,000. In order to do n cubed to predictions, you have to do about 500 million of those. So clearly you see there's a gigantic jump in complexity going from one order to the next. And you have to, uh, the other thing that you're learning from that is that you don't want to do this on a sheet of paper. You want to automate, you want to use uh, computer algebra in order to actually get this task done. So clearly there's a lot of uh, development that needs to go into this if you want to go for, uh, to one order higher. Um, luckily, all these integrals are not independent of each other. They are related to each other. Related via equations that look something like this, coefficient times integral plus coefficient times integral plus coefficient times integral equal to zero. So we can use these equations, we have many of those, to relate them and to eliminate some of those. If we're doing this, we see a gigantic reduction in complexity. We are, okay, leading order stays unchanged. At next to leading order, it's only two integrals that we actually have to, to worry about. At next to next to leading order, 27, and at cube to low, about 1,000. So we're getting back to numbers that are sort of manageable. It's still complicating, cal complicated calculating this, but it's doable. Now, another way of seeing that this is not an easy game is by looking at the, uh, how these coefficients that we have in, in our equations actually look like. So I want to show you an example. This is roughly an example of one of these coefficients. If you can't see anything, don't worry, there's a zoom in. Um, so, <laughs> right, there's, um, there's gigantic, uh, uh, there's, <laughs> yeah, this corner, uh, but, um, yeah, so this is a gigantic polynomials in variables with rational prefactors, and uh, manipulating them using computer algebra systems is really something that pushes our, uh, our limitations quite a bit, and figuring out how we can do this more efficiently um, is quite challenging. Now there's another aspect uh, that I wanted to, to, to mention, and that is uh, how we're doing conceptual developments, or, or what I mean by that. So consider a, consider a scattering process. I have a bunch of particles that are just scattering with each other. And I want, to, I want to think about a limit where one of these particles is very low energetic. It has barely enough energy to actually observe it. If I actually study the equations that are describing the scattering process, I find that uh, the bit that is describing this guy here is actually independent of all the other particles. And I don't, uh, I don't have to know what type they are or something like that. I can find universal structures in the, in the building blocks that we are using, in the, in the equations that we are looking at. And understanding this uh, picture of scattering in general and understanding the, the structure of, uh, of scattering in limits like this allows us to derive, again, powerful simplifications and understand something about scattering itself. Now, using all these uh, developments that we are making, um, we can apply them to a wide range of applications. We can, for example, explore the principles of QFT itself or of gravity. We can make predictions for spatial distributions of Higgs bosons. We can ask the questions, how often are they flying into a certain direction? We can explore other mechanisms of producing Higgs bosons, and so on. And these are just three examples that I was investigating since uh, I started here at MIT. Um, in general, I want to, with my research, I want to push uh, the frontier of uh, precision calculations at the LHC and use this technology on a very broad range and uh, develop further our uh, understanding of quantum field theory um, in this direction. 
And um, all of this research wouldn't be possible with a lot of my collab without a lot of my collaborators. I really want to thank uh, the, the group at MIT here that welcomed me when I arrived here and that I started to um, collaborate with, but also a lot of collaborators all around the globe. And uh, my conclusions of this are that, of this are that uh, I think that our wish to improve our capability to describe experimental observation is son synonymous uh, for our desire to understand nature. I think we're really living in very exciting times because we have now for the first time access to a completely new sector of interactions that we couldn't probe before. Um, an enormous amount of work uh, will be coming our, di our direction in the next couple of years because the LHC is collecting more and more data, they're getting more and more precise, and we really have to work hard on our understanding to actually fully e exploit um, the phenomenology program of the LHC. And with this, I would like to thank uh, Neil and Jane Papolado for the support that is enabling me to do this kind of research. Thank you very much. Neil? Prior to the Higgs being discovered, they were predicting the energy wave that they expected it to be at. Mm -hmm. What, if anything, did led them to make that prediction about the energy range in the first place? So the, I think the most uh, stringent constraints on that we had were from previous experiments. Uh, as you say, the, as you see, the, the standard model um, has only a finite number of particles. And uh, in order for this to be a consistent picture, we could uh, do some estimates of how heavy or how light this Higgs boson actually could be. And using these estimates, we could uh, uh, you know, look at a certain window where we believe this Higgs boson actually has to be. And it turns out that this fits quite nicely and everything seems very consistent within these uh, parameters. It wasn't simply because they exhausted all the energies up to that point? So in terms of looking for any particle or anything that could have caused that, if that wasn't the issue? So in principle, we exhausted all the energies um, up to, let's say, uh, up to 10% or something like this, less than the Higgs boson mass, the energy range. Um, but um, we could, uh, the Higgs boson could have been much heavier than that, and we yeah, didn't know that. Yeah. It seemed to me that they had, were looking very, at a very specifically very narrow range. Well, we were not that sure about it before the discovery. I think. I'll just mention that Ulrich Becker did a lot of the exhausting in that <laughs> search. I have a question to you. In these thousands of terms, how do you ensure that all the science plus or minus? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that is a very good question. <laughs> um, Ideally, uh, you want to have as many checks as possible, right? Uh, some of them are consistency checks. Quantum field theory is actually constraining quite a lot uh, the results that we can get out. And looking at the, the results that uh, uh, we get out of our calculations and the structure of the formula is telling us a lot. On the other hand, we are doing uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of these, uh, let's say, of limits of uh, parts of our calculation you can derive from, uh, from other principles, and you can cross-check that you're uh, in agreement with these principles. But ultimately, there will, of course, be always uh, one part of the calculation that is new, that uh, nobody else has done, and that hasn't been checked, and you can only work redundantly as much as possible and make sure that you do a good job, but ultimately, there will be one part that you don't know. Or Yes. So, error bars. How, how do you really quantify those theoretical error bars? Because obviously, the error bar of the leading order calculation is underestimated. Dramatically. Now we know <laughs> the right result. So, how do you quantify theoretical error So, these error bars are based on an agreement within the community. <laughs> and, um, uh, I wish you would let me do something. Right. <laughs> Um, everybody knows uh, that this was dramatically underestimating uh, things. Now, in order to justify uh, the result that we are presenting at uh, this last bit, we did actually quite a lot of studies. We tried to figure out other ways about thinking about perturbation theory that uh, you know, would let us to estimate parts of the calculations at even higher orders. We looked at other ways of representing our perturbation theory. And all of that seems compatible uh, with these error bars that we are seeing here now. And, um, 
there is really a lot of change also in terms of the formula, in terms of the input that goes into this jump here. Uh -huh. And uh, it's understandable that this is happening to some degree. And um, we're doing our best uh, in estimating that this would actually be a, a reasonable uncertainty. Yeah, the thing that seems odd to me is the data error bar, square root of 3 million. Seems a bit, uh, error bar seems higher than all this back. Um, so the error bars at the moment are roughly at the order of uh, plus minus 10%. Um, it, it's a fit on background. Right. Um, I, I get to ask a, a question. So um, there is an experiment called G minus mm 2. -hmm. And uh, from theoretical quarters, people who are trying to explain this experiment, they're doing things at, at fifth order. And there's a lot of whining uh, that they're not doing everything right. Does, does your work help them? I'm sure a lot of uh, techniques, you can find them overlap. I'm not sure uh, it uh, found direct application there. But uh, yeah, it's something that is it's a very interesting physics problem. And yeah. clearly, yeah. You know, I, it's I, using I, a lot I, of algorithmic complexity. I know you're more QCD based, but mm -hmm. uh, th th they're starting to have trouble with that. Too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Salvo? Yeah. Question also on this plot. The first one is maybe very naive. Are you guaranteed that all the terms in that series are positive, or it just up and that the first four are positive? You're not guaranteed that this is happening, no. That's okay, just so happening. the idea is kind of an infinite number of negative terms later and that brings yep. that down. And the second one is, uh, which, in how many years will the data error bar be so small that you can actually you know, distinguish the next to next leading to the end three leading? If you see what I mean, because right now the error bar data Right. Are larger than, uh, the so um, there are predictions by the experimental community to what's ha going to happen until the year 2035. This is roughly the lifetime of the uh, LHC. And uh, predictions are telling us that they will be able to measure the answer to this particular question at the level of uh, 2.5 to 3.5 percent. So at this level, you will be able to distinguish uh, uh, what's going on there. And so the other thing is that um, the amount of error that I'm showing you here is one particular error. There's lots of errors that I'm not actually including in this, and I should include them if I actually were doing a serious job. But uh, for presentations here, I, I, I included only a very particular one. Um, and um, the problem is that uh, if I combine all these errors, they will be definitely larger than what the LHC will be able to do at the end of its lifetime. So we need, really need to do a better job on all of the sources of uncertainty to actually do a meaningful comparison between experiment and theory. Nergis? So I also asked my question, but I wanted to connect this back to the measurement. What can measurement do to answer that? Okay. One more question. Dan. Years ago in atomic physics, there was an interest in calculating the energy levels of hydrogen in an electric field. And methods for doing this perturbatively, perturbatively um, were developed, and you could carry it out to 100th order. And what you found was that it, it very nicely converged, <coughs> and then it very nicely diverged. And the reason for that is that in an electric field, there are no bound states of hydrogen. It's just a question of time for the hydrogen to electrons to tunnel out. So the question is, do you have confidence that if this could be done to higher orders, the results would be better? So I think um, this is a very interesting problem, and one that is uh, not understood very well. The answer to that is not very under understood very well. And clearly, uh, we have to worry about that at some point. I don't think with three orders in the perturbative expansion, we are quite there yet. There's. Uh, estimates that we can do of this kind of effects when the perturbative series uh, starts to be only an asymptotic series, um, but uh, it's something that we can't quite answer yet. Okay, let's uh, thank Bernard again. <laughs>